evening. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. And we'll read one verse there. Don't, don't close your Bibles, but we'll read one verse and then pray and get right into the message tonight. <coughs> Exodus 17 and verse 1. Uh, let's read that. Let's read that together. The Bible says. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word, recording for us the events that we needed to know about that would impact us and affect us. Thank you that uh, all your scriptures given uh, by inspiration that it's all profitable for us. Lord, may we gain from it. May we grow closer to you as a result of reading it, studying it, and hearing it preached and taught. We pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will speak to us through it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting that the Israelites had left Egypt uh, just a few chapters earlier. Uh, they are on their way to the Promised Land. They have not yet received what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. Uh, that's still a few chapters away where Moses goes up on the mountainside and God gives him tablets of stone with which he has used his own finger to etch commandments into them and gives them back to him. Uh, we haven't gotten to that part yet. In chapter 13 is where God appeared unto them in a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of cloud by night. He uh, led them whatever direction, wherever he wanted them to go. And so he has led them to this place uh, called Rephidim. And, you know, it's, it says again, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. That's a capital S. It doesn't mean the wilderness where everybody did that was wrong. That was just the name of the location. And it says, After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. I'm going to make some observations here and as we go through and, and read a little bit more in just a moment. But I want to say this. Sometimes God leads you to a place where you will have a need. They were where they were because God had specifically commanded them to be there. And don't think for a minute that God didn't know there was no water there. I heard a story about, uh, about a boy and, and his mama uh, having a hard time not having enough money uh, for food and and um, this was back in the olden days where they would keep cornmeal in a, in a barrel and she had gotten a bowl and she had scraped the bottom of that barrel and gotten everything and, and there wasn't enough in that bowl to uh, to make anything and, and she just sat down beside the barrel and started weeping and started crying and, and crying out unto God and the little boy came up to his mother and he said mama don't you think God heard that bull scrape the bottom of the barrel? And, and absolutely, God heard that bull scrape the bottom of the barrel. Absolutely, God knew there was no water in that area. God knew exactly how many people and how many animals, the number of livestock and everything else that was uh, uh, in, in, the, in the group of the Israelites. There was the Israelites themselves. There was the mixed uh, company. Some Egyptians that had said, uh, we're out of here. Uh, we're tired of being on the losing side. And, and your God's bigger than all of our gods put together. Uh, we're coming with you. And uh, they never were fully committed. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's, a, that's a different message. But they, they were with them. And God knew exactly how many people there were. And exactly how much water there wasn't. I want to I read a verse for you uh, in Philippians chapter 4. And a very familiar verse, verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A lot of people read that and they say, God is going to fill all my needs according to his riches and glory. And I think God uh, very much can do that. Uh, but that's not really the words that are found in that verse. The Bible says, My God shall supply all your need. God will give you a need. God is going to supply. Uh, God, what do you have? What are the supplies you have for me today? I have a need to give you today. And so the Israelites had come to this wilderness of Rephidim, and God hands them a need 
called thirst. There's no water in that in that region. There's no water in that area. And, <clears throat> and, and God knew that. And so God gives you your needs, and he gives you your needs based on his riches and glory. So no matter how big the need is, it will never exceed the riches that he has in glory. I heard about, uh, uh, John Rice used to talk about a dream that he had had about uh, having died and gone to heaven. And, and when he got there, an angel was given a tour of the place. And they got to this region and there was just uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of, of warehouses. And John Rice said, well, and the angel was saying, now over here is this and, and over here is where John the Baptist lives and everything else. And John Rice said, well, what's, what's with all these buildings? He said, oh, those are warehouses. And over here in this other area, that's, that's where this uh, man that lives and, and this is what's going on over here. He says, well, what's in those warehouses? And the angel said, well, those warehouses are full of things that God's people failed to ask for. And, and so <clears throat> everything that they had need of, God already had the fulfillment of that need already in his warehouse and I understand that's just a dream that John writes, but it illustrates a truth that we find in the Bible uh, that whatever needs you have, God has supplied that need and it has been in accordance to the riches that he already has in glory. And so it's almost like a, um, a parent saying, all right, son, if you mow the grass, I will give you a certain amount of money. Now, a parent is going to be very careful to not promise more money than what they have in uh, within their reach maybe in their pocket or or at least in the bank account uh if they only have five dollars they're not going to say i'll give you ten dollars to cut the grass uh they're going to say well i can i can give you five dollars for cutting the grass and, and so they they make a promise based on what they have and god provides our needs based on what he always uh, already has and none of our needs that we ever had, none, no need that ever comes in our life will ever surpass the riches that he has in glory. It may surpass the riches that exist on this world. It may surpass the riches that are in all the bank accounts, all the uh, gold mines to be found, all the diamond mines, and all the ruby mines put together. But they will never surpass the riches that God has at his disposal. Let's look at the very next verse. So, so let's picture this. The children of Israel have left Egypt. During the daytime, there's a big pillar of, of cloud, and, and wherever it moves, that's where they follow. If God wants them to walk in the nighttime, that cloud turned into fire, and it would guide them in the night. And then when it stopped, they would stop, set up their tents, and that's where they would stay. And so they have been led by God according to the commandment of the Lord to this location. A location where there's no water. Verse 2, here's their reaction. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. I had to look up that word chide. It means to blame, to scold, to quarrel, to find fault, to contend with words of anger, to make a complaint. So they get to this location and they start looking around. Well, I need to refill my canteen. I need to water my livestock. My dog wants water. The cat looks thirsty too, but the dog really needs water. And, and, and so then they go to Moses, and then they start to blame Moses for bringing them to a place where there's no water. They begin to scold Moses. Moses, you shouldn't have done that. You should have known better. You spent 40 years out in this wilderness taking care of your father-in-law's sheep, you should know where the water is and you should have known this isn't it. They begin to quarrel with Moses and they begin to find fault with Moses. They begin to contend with words of anger against Moses. And they make a complaint. And yet they were right where they were supposed to be. Right where God put them. Here's something interesting as I was looking at this. An idea came to mind and it was this. They had a mentality 
based on environment. They had an environment-based mentality. Let's read on to see what happened. Because they've looked around. They've checked out their environment. There's no water. They have maybe even dug a little hole to see if maybe you can get to some water, some some uh, dirt that's at least have some dampness that would show you we can go deeper and find water. And it, their environment has told them very clearly there's no water here. And so they begin arguing, accusing Moses, the man of God, demanding of him, give us water that we may drink. Now let's read on in verse 2. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? See, Moses had a God mentality. He said, why are you blaming me? Why are you fussing with me about it? Why are you saying this is my fault? Why are you scolding me? Why are you arguing with me? Why are you angry with me? Why are you bringing your complaint to me? And he said, really, what's going on is you're tempting the Lord. Why are you tempting the Lord? Did Moses think he was the Lord? No. Moses knew he wasn't the Lord. But what he knew is that their fuss was not with him. He didn't put them there. He didn't bring them there. It wasn't his plan for them to be where they were at the time that they were there. He was simply following God's plan. And Moses had a God mentality about that. Whereas they had an environment mentality. Now it's interesting because God had done so much to prove to them that he had complete and utter control over their entire environment. You look at the, the plagues that they had just endured in Egypt. Nine out of the ten. The, the tenth being the, the death of the firstborn. But let's look at it. the first one. Water being turned to blood. That's environmental. That's oh, There's water and now it's being turned to blood. The next thing is, is uh, an overwhelming amount of frogs through the land. That's something you can look at and say, this is what's around. This is what I'm living in. I'm living in a land that's overrun by frogs. And then the next one was lice. And they were living in a land that was overrun by lice. This is the Egyptians, that is. And then after that came flies. Then came a disease on the livestock. And then came boils. And then came hail. And whatever the hail didn't destroy, a wave of locusts came through and ate up the plants that weren't destroyed by the hail. And then came darkness. And by the way, these plagues were all over on the Egyptian side. None of them happened in Hebrew town. And so the Egyptians, when it got so dark over there, they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. If they could make their way over and cross the line to where the Israelites lived, they say, why is it not dark over here? And the Israelites, the Jews, could have very easily said, well, because our God's the God of the environment. He controls the environment. He controls where it's day and where it's night. It's interesting uh, when Moses would, would announce a plague that God was going to send, Pharaoh's magicians would come forth, his sorcerers, and they would try to duplicate the same miracle but they could never undo the miracle and after a certain point they got to where they were not able to duplicate what God was doing through Moses and they turned and looked at Pharaoh and they said this is the finger of God this isn't something that 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 we can reproduce in fact the only thing they were able to do is take something that was bad and make it worse they could add, you know, well, yeah, we can make frogs show up too. We already have frogs. Can you get rid of them? No, nope, can't do that. Oh, well, we can we can turn water into blood too. No, no, no. Can you turn it back into water? No, we can't do that. All we can do is make it more bad. But these plagues were placed upon the Egyptians. And the Israelites... They got to witness these things happen and they got to see their God show his power and dominance over the false gods of Egypt and over the environment all around them. Finally, it got to the point where Pharaoh said, get out of here. Don't ever come back. Most of Egypt said, get out of here. Don't ever come back. 
here are traveling goods, here's carts loaded up. And the Bible says that they spoiled Egypt. They, they just took everything of value with them. On their way, Pharaoh changed his mind, said, we got to get them back. And God put a cloud in between them. And Pharaoh couldn't see and couldn't get through, and his, his military couldn't get through, and, and the Israelites were just marching on. And they came to the Red Sea, an environmental factor. And God said, Moses, hold up that stick and put it out over the, over the water there. And Moses did exactly what God said to do and held his rod out over the water, and the water parted. And God caused the wind to blow, another demonstration. So he parts the water. He's controlling the environment. He's controlling their surroundings, the things that they are faced with. And then, okay, well, it's still kind of wet down there. And God says, hold on just, just a little bit. And he causes the wind to blow and he dries the land up. In fact, where they crossed is much more shallow than the rest of the Red Sea. It's like there's a land bridge hidden underneath that water. And, and the slope from the shore is a gentle slope downwards. And then it, it flattens out. And then it, as it gets to the other side, it's a gentle slope upwards. But off to the side, it's a deep drop off. And then at the other end, it's a steep climb. But right where they crossed, God had controlled that environment at the creation of everything. God has sustained that environment during the, the, the worldwide, the global flood. He kept that land bridge in place. He kept that sea right there or put it right there. They got to the other side and it wasn't long. Their canteens had run out. And they arrived at a body of water. But the water was bitter. And God turned that bitter water sweet. See, time and time again, up to this point, God had already shown himself powerful to the, to the children of Israel and showing them that he had control over everything around them, their entire environment, everything that they would ever face. And yet they get to this point and they look at their environment. And Moses said, Moses is the one that brings up God and gets him involved. Verse 3, and the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. Take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it, uh, take in thine hand, I'm sorry, take in thine hand and go. Behold, notice this, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And of course, we know if he smote the rock and water came out of that rock, that rock is still there. It's split wide open. There's erosion marks from the inside of that rock outwards. There's evidence that that had physical evidence that's still there. Now let me give you the secret that they seemed to not know. You as an individual, if you're saved, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior, you've asked Him for, uh, for forgiveness of your sin and to be your Savior, as an individual, you have direct access to the very throne of God. Hebrews 4.16 says, says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. And it goes on and says that we may find mercy. The Israelites didn't have to come and complain and quarrel and fuss at Moses. Understand, 
the only mediator you need is Jesus. They didn't need Moses to access God for them. And really, they hadn't asked Moses to access God. They were just fussing. They were just having a bad attitude. After all that they had seen, and one might think, you know, if, if I saw all that, I'd be convinced. What have you not seen? Have you not seen the sunrise every day? The sunset every evening? Season following season? Have you not seen the miracle of, of life, of birth, of the sustaining power of God upon this planet? See, at every turn where their circumstances were bad, they thought they were blaming Moses. And Moses says, why are you talking to me? And so many times people have a bad situation. They are brought to a place in life where they have a need and they blame the preacher. It's the preacher. If it weren't for the preacher, I wouldn't be here right now. It might be that you are right where God wants you to be. But what Moses said in verse 2 is, Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? In reality, they weren't chiding with Moses. They thought they were. It's your fault, Moses. We're blaming you. Why are you blaming me? God is the one that brought you to where you are. They were bad-mouthing God. Now here's what they should have been doing. They should have been going to God and saying, God, I'm right where you told me to be. And I have a need that I know you can fill. Now, we didn't see the water turn to blood in Egypt. We didn't see the frogs and the flies and the lice and the, uh, <clears throat> the disease on the livestock. We didn't see the boils. Or the darkness. We didn't see those things, but they're all recorded for us. And so much more. We didn't see the Red Sea parting, but it's recorded for us. We know that it happened. We didn't see Jonah get swallowed by a whale, but we know that it happened. We didn't see that, that whale get an upset stomach and regurgitate Jonah up onto the shore, but we know that it happened. And everything that's recorded in the Bible, we know that it happened. By faith, we know. And when we come to a circumstance and we say I have a need, the very first thing you need to remember is that need is not bigger than the supply that God has. It's not bigger than the riches that He has. See, I have a need. I, I sure would. I need for uh, the U.S. deficit to be wiped out. You understand it could be wiped out with just a little bit of pavement from heaven. Well, they they got, they got so much gold. What are we going to do with all this gold? Pave the roads with it. <laughs> Go out there and, and, and build some streets out of it. And see, they should have been going to God and saying, God, I'm right where you want me to be. And by the way, that's if you find yourself having a need, make sure you are where God wants you to be. Go to God and say, I'm, I'm where you want me to be. I have a need. That I know, based on your record, I know you can take care of this. God, I saw you handle the environment time and time and time again while we were still in Egypt. I've seen that even after we left Egypt, you still have control of the environment. We were thirsty before and you turned bitter water into sweet water. We were locked in by the water and you pushed it out of the way and held it there until all of us got through and then released it upon Pharaoh and his entire military. I know you have control of the environment. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. You know, Jesus told the woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water. What a sad thing that throughout that whole crowd, Moses was the one that knew who God was. And Moses was the one that went to God and asked for water. Here's, here's the little secret. They all could have gone. 
Moses wasn't a priest. He wasn't an intercessor. He wasn't a go-between. He was the man that God had sent them, that God used to lead them out. But he belonged to the same family that everybody else there did. They were all descendants of Israel. They all were God's people. Now, not everybody in the world, uh, people, I've heard somebody say, we all God's people. No, we're not all God's people. If, if you're born again, you're God's people. You're a part of his family. But if you're not saved, you have a different father. But all these Israelites, each one of them as individuals could have gone to God and say, God, we have a need. My household is thirsty. My wife needs some water. My children need some water. My animals are going to die if they don't get some water. If you want us to go somewhere else to find water, we'll go there to find water. If you want us to stay here, then we're going to rely on you to bring the water to us. They were right where God wanted them to be, but they weren't saying what they should have been saying. And they didn't have the attitude of faith that they should have had. Moses went to God. God, this is a bad environment. Moses wasn't worried about water. He was worried they were going to pick up rocks and start throwing them at him. <laughs> he said, God, I've got a problem. I have a need. You've put me in a situation where I have a need. And God said, get your stick. That rod that you used before. Get, some, get the elders together. And have them come with you. There's a big old rock over here. I'm going to stand on top of it and you're going to hit it. You all get water. You all get water. See, God provided for Moses' need. And in so doing, he provided for the needs of the others as well. But God, I have a need. I know I'm where you want me to be. I'm going to trust you take care of that need. Let's close tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for recording these things for us that we may learn from them and that it may help our faith to be stronger in you. Lord, when we come to those places where we have a need and we know we are where you want us to be, rather than to look to the environment, may your Holy Spirit remind us to look to you. As we leave here tonight, we pray that you'll take us home safely. Return us again at the appointed hour. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.